And it's recording now, although I didn't get the now recording signal. Um, and I would like to call to order the special meeting of the Norwich School Board of uh, November 17th, 2020. It is now 1.06 p.m. Uh, we do have an agenda in board docs. And um, I uh, first up, we do have uh, an opportunity for public comment. Um, and uh, we do, I think, have one member of the public. So uh, we do have an option to uh, raise hands. And I can uh, call on folks and let you ask your question if you have it. If there is no question, I'll move on down our, uh, our agenda today. OK, not seeing any. Um, moving down the agenda, next up is agenda review. And I do have need to uh, move around uh, one thing I uh, I didn't, and Ryan, I'm sorry I didn't explain this well enough. The uh, uh, negotiations process uh, 4B there is actually something we're moving into the uh, public portion of the session tonight. This is or the, today. It's just uh, more of the overview and the um, background for our newer members of the board um, to talk through what, what the negotiation process looks like and collective bargaining with regard to uh, Vermont's uh, education uh, system. So um, I, if it's all right with board members, uh, that uh, negotiations process, which is listed as 4B, will be in a, a public session. I do have need to go into non-public after that, so we'll keep the non-public there. Uh, is that uh, move all right with everybody online here? Okay. And with that, uh, let's keep moving down our agenda here. And the next item on the agenda is actually this negotiations process. So as board members uh, know, and, and the public can see too, because it is even in public content, despite um, it being in a non-public session there, there are a couple of links that uh, we provided for board members background. One is a general overview of the collective bargaining process that was done by the Vermont School Board Association a number of years ago, um, but still serves as a good reference point for uh, board members to follow uh, when understanding the negotiations process. We also have a link to the Norwich teacher and support staff contracts, um, which are available on the SAU webpage. And then um, we do have an administrative content though. I'm sorry, Ryan, I didn't get a chance to answer you either there, but those are two um, reports that board members can see from the fact finder who did fact finding for us in the 2017 negotiations with both the teachers and the support staff. Those are public documents. So we'll move those into, uh, into public content after the meeting. Um, with that, uh, Neil and I, having been on the board for several years and served as a negotiations committee for as long as I can remember, uh, six or seven years now, I think, uh, through several rounds with uh, Jamie and, uh, and John Alden before that. Um, I wanted to uh, give our other uh, board members the opportunity to um, uh, hear about uh, the process uh, with a bit of a scaled back version of that overview that uh, we sent out uh, from the Vermont School Board Association and give uh, members a opportunity to ask questions of the process itself. I am going to share my um, screen so that we can go through that and I will attempt to do that right now. Um, Let's see if I can find. Let me know if you can all see that. All right. And I need to call up one more thing. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to go through the slides here. Neil and I are going to talk through. Um, the process here. Uh, this is our agenda for today. We'll uh, give a, a quick overview of the process itself from uh, beginning to end. Uh, Neil's going to talk to the step and track system that we have in place in the Mary Cross uh, School. Um, Neil will give an overview of uh, statewide healthcare bargaining, which obviously um, changed a great deal in the last couple of years as it went from local to uh, state level. Uh, I will uh, bring us back to uh, the mediation and fact-finding process of the of the negotiations process and talk about um, the specific examples that I uh, just referenced in board docs. We have access to the last uh, reports from the fact finder. And then Neil is going to wrap up with uh, some uh, general background on uh, NEA support for local bargaining units and the uh, Vermont teachers' salaries. Uh, um, 
comparables there. So this is a, um, a slide that you may have seen in the uh, Vermont School Board Association overview. It gives a nice uh, straightforward uh, look at uh, the process beginning to end. Uh, I'm gonna stick to just the left side of this right now. We'll get to the right side of it as we move through the uh, presentation here. Um, so the first part of the process is an exchange of, uh, of letters uh, that uh, notes that uh, there is a desire to enter into the bargaining process. In our district, this starts in the early fall timeframe uh, and is done before October 15th with an exchange of uh, um, messages between the uh, teachers negotiation team and the uh, school boards. The Formation of Negotiations Council is, is just that. It's uh, the uh, board representations to negotiations, as well as the, um, uh, the uh, teachers. And uh, this year's uh, group is led by um, Allison Litton and Neil and I, as I mentioned, are, are the uh, board's negotiations uh, committee. The uh, first, uh, order of business for the um, negotiations committees is to come together and uh, set ground rules. Um, it's not required, but it is certainly a recommended part of the process. The ground rules tend to outline uh, things uh, as simple as uh, identifying the spokesperson for the each of the committees of so the schools boards, as well as the teachers, and um, outline some of the understandings of how you're going to proceed through the process, um, how uh, proposals are gonna be exchanged, um, how many uh, meetings into the process you are able to bring new items to the to the board? Um, what uh, what happens if you uh, decide that you have reached impasse, and um, and then the process of going about finding a mediated uh, mediator or mediator fact mediating fact finder. Um, also, it gets down into the details of releasing uh, public relations um, uh, requests and. Um, and who is going to be responsible for that for each committee. The other uh, aspect of it is you uh, usually come out of the ground rules with the first uh, two or three meetings set as well. Um, and then uh, once you have that, obviously you begin the bargaining process. Um, I'll back up a little bit because before you even uh, enter into negotiations, it's always a good idea to review your last contract, the current contract, um, meet with uh, administrators, and, and potentially um, uh, your legal uh, support as well to review the contract and consider areas that you might want to focus on. Um, obviously, the things that are going to come up in most negotiations are considerations of compensation, uh, salary, um, vacation, um, other leave opportunities, uh, professional development, in our case, enrichment grants, and those uh, types of things are at the top of the list. Uh, although there's often uh, returns to uh, certain definitional things that always uh, come up, whether by virtue of changing uh, laws or things that uh, one side or the other would like to address in the uh, contract as it currently stands. And uh, through the bargaining process, obviously you hope to reach a point where you settle. Uh, in some cases you may reach impasse, in which case you move on to the right side of the chart you see there. And that's where I'm gonna pause for a minute and turn it over to Neil to talk to the step and track system. And we'll come back to the, the latter parts that could potentially play out in the negotiations process. Okay, thanks Tom. Um, and before we just jump straight into the step and track system, just a little bit of brief history. And if you guys had um, viewed the VSBA webinar on this, it's just a, gonna be a quick repeat of that information. Um, but back in the 1970s, Vermont teachers were actually ranked the lowest in the nation on teacher salaries. As a result, at that time, there was a push um, to increase salaries. And one of the quickest ways to do it, and the way that we ended up uh, in most every district here in the state of Vermont, is the indexed salary schedule. Uh, the schedule, as you see here, consists of steps and tracks. And an employee's placement on the grid depends on their level of um, education or accumulated credits and their number of years of experience. So each year, unless a teacher um, is already on the top step, um, they will move forward one step. And if they've earned enough additional credits or degree, they can also move to a new track. Um, what you're looking at here is just the first, um, uh, just a subsection of our current step and track system. Um, ours is what's considered a five by four grid. 
So you'll see listed here the difference between each step uh, in the system. So the steps are the ones that go down on the left-hand side there. The difference between each step is 5%. So you'll see that the index of one, which is on step one and track one for the BA is a one, and then it goes 1.05, 1.10, 1 et cetera, down there. The difference between each, each track is 4%. So you'll see it goes from one to 1.04 1 for track two. Um, as I had mentioned, just to make this a little bit more readable, um, I'm only showing you the first few steps and the first few tracks. Um, our complete uh, salary schedule has seven tracks and 17 steps. Um, so at the top end of our system, so it would be the cell that's all, all the way down in the lower um, right-hand corner. And like this, as I said before, this is an abbreviated version, but at the top end of our system, the salary is $91,468. Um, during negotiations, you'll typically hear about a certain percentage that is applied to the base. Um, what this means is that the percentage increase is applied to the step and the track with an index of one. So in our case, it's the 44,837 uh, cell there. Um, and then the remaining cells on the grid are recalculated based on the index. So as an example, let's say um, that we agreed to a 2% increase on the base. So track one, step one would increase to $45,734. Tom, if you can just go to the next slide. Yeah, sorry. Right. So you'll see, so here we're in year two now, 2% 2 increase on base. That um, index number is now $45,735, $734. And then the rest of the cells in the grid are recalculated based on, on the index. Um, so for example, if in year one, you had a teacher that was on track two, step seven, and actually Tom, if you can just go back one slide. So in year one, they're on uh, track two, step seven, that you're looking at a salary of 60,082. Um, after you apply the 2% onto the base, and then that teacher is eligible for one step movement, um, they will move up to track two, step eight, which is $63,570. Um, and that would end up being a difference of uh, $3,488 or a 5.81% salary increase. So um, just a, <clears throat> a moment here, there are some challenges that are associated with the step and track system. Um, one of the primary things is that it can be confusing. Um, especially for folks out in the community. So folks may hear that the teachers receive a 2% salary increase to the base, um, and that may sound good. Um, what they might not understand though, is that for employees who haven't maxed out on the step and the step and track system, it actually equates to an increase typically in excess of, of 5% based on the, the built-in uh, um, sentence. Um, there's a built-in cost to the system each year for teachers that are moving up a step, in our case, um, with no salary increase at all on the base, um, step movement costs us, and Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong, roughly about 1.2% more um, in salaries and benefits versus the prior year. So even if we didn't offer any salary increases at all, just step movement in the system equates to about a 1.2% increase um, versus the prior year. Um, Salaries on the lower end of the step and track system um, can also make it difficult to attract and retain newer teachers. You'll see that the low number here is actually, you know, for our area and in our community kind of low. Um, and it just makes it a little bit more difficult to attract and retain um, some of the newer folks. Um, there's also a significant difference between the lowest and the highest step, both within the track, but within um, the entire uh, system. Um, you'll see that step one, track one, um, uh, starts out at $44,837. If we move all the way to step 17 of track seven, which is not shown here in the grid, um, you're looking at a salary of $91,468. And um, you know, while education experience do have a role to play in this, uh, some of the state's best teachers are actually on the lower end of the, of the, the step and track system. 
Um, and the scale can make it difficult to justify paying some teachers almost twice as much as what others um, are earning for essentially um, you know, the same or very similar positions. Um, also to note is because in our contract, we pay um, a certain amount of money in professional development funds for teachers to uh, take courses and earn additional credits. Um, the earning of those credits can actually bump them up into a, a new track um, on the system. So that is a quick overview of the step and track system. I think Kelly has a question now. Okay. Can we, are you taking questions? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. But yes, I should have said, sorry. Um, the simple question, and it may have been in the video, I was only able to skim through it quickly, but is step and track law? I understand it is, is it? No, it's, it's not, not law. Okay, just that's that was my question. Thank you. You ready to move on now? Yeah. Um, so if I wind the clock even back a little bit further, I back in, I think it was either 2016 or 2017, um, VHI, which is the organization that provides uh, healthcare benefits to um, teachers and support staff in the state, needed to move off of the existing health insurance plans that they offered um, because of the tax implications associated with moving to the Affordable Care Act. So there was a wholesale effort there to uh, go out and um, basically come up with a new set of um, health insurance plans that would be available to teachers. Um, during the course of that process, there had been some uh, chatter and some discussion of moving to a, a, a statewide healthcare benefit for teachers, similar to what existed for um, other state employees at the time. Um, uh, some folks felt that that was the ideal time to do it since there was going to be such a drastic change um, in the health care plans being offered to teachers, um, but it just didn't really gain any traction uh, in the legislature that year, um, you know, in part, I think also to uh, the NEA just being firmly uh, against that notion. Um, fast forward then to 2018, um, the NEA had sort of changed their position on this and actually um, were willing to support a move to uh, a statewide healthcare um, benefit for school employees. So uh, during that legislative session, we ended up with Act 11, which created the Public Employee Health Benefits Commission. Um, that, commi that, that act required that all school employees move toward the same health insurance benefit. Um, it, it established a commission um, that included 10 uh, individual commissioners, four of which are appointed by Vermont NEA, uh, one of which is appointed by uh, AFSCME, which is the uh, sort of the second um, labor union in Vermont representing um, support staff and uh, other um, employees in schools. Um, and then five commissioners that are appointed by the Vermont School Boards Association. It established a process um, that could end with binding arbitration um, and you'll see later on, in fact, the very first round of negotiations did end in binding arbitration. Um, but more importantly, what it did was it actually eliminated um, bargaining of health insurance at the local level. So where previously, um, when we got to the table for those local negotiations with teachers, um, we would discuss um, possible changes in either uh, premium cost share or out-of-pocket costs with the teachers. This um, act eliminated that since all of the negotiations on healthcare, which included premium cost share um, and out-of-pocket expenses are all being done at the state level. And it will be the same for every teacher in every school district across the state of Vermont. Um, the first round of bargaining, uh, as I mentioned earlier, did end in arbitration. And during that arbitration, the arbitrator selected um, the employee's last best offer. Um, uh, the end result of that was that um, if you looked at it from a statewide level, um, it actually increased um, the, the cost of health insurance benefits being paid by employers, by school districts, by almost $25 uh, million. Um, Tom, if you'll move forward to the next slide. I'm going to pause just for a second. Neil, I see Garrett's got his hand up. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Yeah, sorry, just one question. You On the previous slides, you had mentioned that if you have a 2% increase, it results in a 5% at the top. So how, I was just looking at like your bottom right-hand number compared to the bottom right-hand number, I'm getting like a 2% increase. So how, just because I think that's, so like that 69,516 compared to the, if you flip back the previous slide, like that's still a 2% increase. So where, what, what did you say about it? If it goes up 2%, yeah, because, it actually goes up 5%. Uh, yeah, so when you move in the step and track system from year to year, you also have to remember to move up a step. So the numbers that you oh, want to compare. Okay. So yeah, you want to compare like step eight in year one to step nine in year two, right? Because that teacher, okay. that, that employee is going to move up a step. Every year you just move up. The, okay, because you have to move up the step. I see what you're saying. Uh, unless okay. you're on the top step. So for us in a lot of these tracks, that equates to about 17 years of service. Which is what you're saying on our last call. Okay. Yep. Okay, okay. cool. Um, so these are the details of the uh, of the of the arbitrator's decision. Uh, covers all teachers and support staff that work a minimum of 17 and a half hours a week. Uh, it began on January 1 of 2021, and it's a, all of these are a minimum of a two-year agreement, so it'll expire um, at the end of December in 2022. Uh, for premiums, um, teachers will uh, cost share on the premiums with an 80-20 cost split employer picks up 80%, employee picks up 20%. Um, for support staff, um, mostly because support staff across the state in those locally negotiated contracts were sort of all over the board, um, the recommendation was is that um, if they were not already at an 80-20 split in their local district, that the um, it would increase by 2% until they reached 80-20, um, that's 2% each year. Um, for out-of-pocket costs, um, the decision by the arbitrator was to supply an employer-funded first dollar HRA, um, which means that the employer, the school district, is responsible for the first dollar out-of-pocket costs on the HRA. Uh, the funding for that is that for um, uh, single plans, um, it's uh, funded at $2,100 for all other plans, which is a two-person parent, child, and family plan. Um, it's employer funded at $4,200 and then support staff. Um, you'll see that the numbers are a little bit more um, generous, I think mostly acknowledging the fact that a lot of the support staff um, are earning quite a bit less than the teachers do. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, the result of the arbitrator's award um, equated to about a $25 million increase in benefit costs for employers, so school districts um, statewide. I think, uh, Garrett's got Daniel, sorry. So what's that? So that's the twenty one hundred and twenty four to two hundred. That's the HRA. So and we have a total increase of twenty five hundred. So what is it like per family or per single per month that we're paying teachers for premiums? Uh, I don't know what the per month. So these are annual figures, right? We we uh, the employer fund we fund the full amount at the beginning of the school year. Right. But no, I'm just saying that because this is the um, the 2100 and the 4200 is the HRA, but obviously we're paying we're paying the state, I guess. On I'm, I'm guessing either a single or like a family or all other a monthly premium to cover them on your health care, right? Just like we all do in our own businesses. Um, actually, Tom, if you go to the next slide, this might have the answer that you're looking for. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, yeah, so I was kind of saying, okay, you know, pre a family should be about two grand. So, okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so cool. if you look okay. at these, this, th these were the figures from last year. Um, mm -hmm. So we have seen, I think there was a little bit of an increase in the health insurance stuff, but these are the numbers that from last year. And so you'll see um, what the cost share is for the premiums for each. And sorry, to be clear, um, employees have the choice of four different health care plans. Um, the figures that you see here are for the one that's called uh, CDHP Gold, if you look at the VHI offerings. Um, this tends to be the middle of the road plan and actually the one that nearly all employees have selected. Um, and so the numbers that you see here apply to that plan and you'll see the cost here. So how much the employer um, or the school district is picking up on a monthly basis versus what the employee um, is contributing. Okay. And then if you flip to the next slide, 
Um, this shows you um, the share of out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and it's different between teachers and support staff I had mentioned in that, in that previous slide. And this is an annual number though? Correct. Whereas the previous slide was their monthly premium? Were you done there now? Yep. OK. So I'm going to bring us back to the process. So if you remember the slide at the beginning there, um, where you get to either settlement or, um, or impasse, the next phase there, if you get to impasse, is to determine whether or not you uh, wish to move on to mediation and potentially fact finding too. Uh, mediation is not a requirement, it's optional, but uh, in years past when we've reached this, uh, reached impasse in years past, we have gone with a mediator. In recent years, uh, because mediators are very hard to schedule given the numerous uh, um, contract negotiations that are going on across the state, we've tended towards mediated fact finding, which is what we've agreed to in our ground rules uh, this year. And that uh, enables us to schedule with one mediator at, at one time to make sure that they can go back to back if we're not able to resolve any issues in mediation. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, at, at that point, if there is a decision that impasse has been reached, the two sides exchange um, names of potential mediators, in this case, mediated fact finders, and uh, a, Upon agreement of, of those uh, mediated fact finders, um, you schedule with the uh, person and then set the session. Um, in the session, what uh, happens if it's mediation, the uh, two sides meet at, uh, and are, you know, just for to go through the process here, and usually in separate rooms in, uh, in a location and uh, go back and forth with the uh, fact finder, excuse me, with the mediator on uh, determining um, how you may work around some of the uh, issues that are left to be resolved in the process. Uh, if uh, you go through that session that usually uh, is scheduled uh, over the course of one day and don't meet uh, resolution by the end of uh, the mediation session, then uh, there is uh, fact finding which comes next, in which case uh, the mediator um, requests more information from each of the uh, negotiating teams and their support, uh, in our case, uh, Legal Sport and, and Jamie, and as well as um, uh, from the teacher's side, their NEA uh, representative. And that uh, information is in means of support of the rationale for the proposals. Uh, it can be uh, local financial um, implications. It can um, uh, be a wide range of other things that are coming into play throughout the course of the negotiation process. Um, but it is a packet that's passed along to the, uh, the fact finder who will use that in coming to their uh, resolution and the report that is then uh, issued uh, later. Um, once the report is in with the uh, fact finder's findings, then um, you can either accept them or you can disagree with them. And, uh, and if that's the case, uh, after uh, 30 days of receipt of the fact finders report, then the school board has the option to impose a contract and the teachers have the, the right to strike. Um, just by way of a quick example, as I mentioned earlier, we did uh, go to mediated fact finding in our last uh, round of negotiations back in 2017 with uh, both the support staff and the, uh, the teachers. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, after providing uh, background on the rationale for the offers uh, and you know, as I mentioned too, this uh, includes the current economic situation, cost of living index, local drivers and comparables. Um, the fact finder is supposed to take that into account while issuing um, their findings. Um, oftentimes uh, what we found though is that the major driving factor comes down to comparables uh, to other negotiated contracts and doesn't always take into consideration other industry trends. So by that, I mean outside of the educational field. So um, what you'll find and what you would see in that report that was attached to board docs is that the comparables that are generally given are the results of negotiated contracts that have already uh, been settled throughout the rest of the state. Um, this does complicate things too, because it doesn't always take into consideration relative pay scales or the unique structure of Vermont system. And by that, I mean, um, we're all paying into the same central uh, system here. 
So contracts that are settled in one side of the state do have an effect on all other sides of the state too. So that's, um, that's been a, a challenge uh, for us to explain why we're coming to our rationale when we're trying to consider much more beyond just the uh, comparables of any other settled uh, negotiated contracts uh, throughout the state. Um, so um, um, because there are a number of other factors that we think uh, should come into play there. Neil, did I, were there other things I, uh, should be addressing here or Jamie? I think you covered it. Okay. Are there any questions at this point about uh, mediation and fact finding and mediated fact finding? Oh, Jamie's got something for us. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I pulled up the rates, the, the health rates for the year that we're in and I'll send them out to the board or I can okay. post them to board docs either one. Thanks. Any questions at this point? Oh, Kelly? Just want to be sure I understand that there really is, once the parties declare an impasse, am I right in understanding that there is one step, and in, in this case, mediated fact finding, and if nothing is resolved after that, it's imposition on the school board's part or a strike on the teacher's part. Is that right? If, if the sides do not agree to the, if, Correct. if there's no resolution of mediation and if the sides do not agree to the fact finders report, that's the next step, yeah. And um, if, well, I would add Tom, actually there's a, there's a third step which is there's just neither side does anything. Um, and right. they and, live under and, the current contract. And well, no? uh, in a sense, yes, but in a sense, no, right. So there is no uh, current contract in, in that case, right? Because the contract's already expired. So what both sides essentially would then say is that they're willing to go, all, all they would have received was the step increase um, that was uh, coming to them. And then typically what would happen if that is the case is that both sides might just agree to sit back down and begin bargaining all over again. You but could do that at that point. Yeah, yeah. Is once you get through the fact finders phase, it's not required that the board impose a contract. It okay, just that's allowed at that point. And it's not required that the teachers strike. It just becomes allowed at that point. Okay, but you, you answered the question. There is another step should you choose to take it beyond the mediated fact finding or mediation then fact finding, right? Uh, yes. I get it. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, any other questions? Okay, with that, I'll move down our list here. Um, sorry, Tom, I had a quick question. Yeah, sorry, I missed you. Lisa. It's okay. Um, so based upon what I just heard, does that mean that you could be caught in a perpetual loop of starting over, starting over, starting over? I mean, because if you don't reach agreement and then you choose just to do nothing, which basically you can then choose to start over, assuming that cycle could happen again and again and again, is there a point where, you know, somebody gets forced into doing something or do you just hope that that never happens? Well, I think that's where you have to the stand either as the board or the uh, the teachers union has to come to some resolution at that point. Um, otherwise, yeah, I guess you could probably keep going in a circular loop. Too. Okay, so it, it would it would sort of be on good faith. Somebody would do something different than just starting over again and again and again. Yeah. I, I uh, yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah, that that scenario is probably un, unlikely to occur. That means that you know. Uh, teachers would have gone without, um, right. other than step increases, they would have gone without salary increases. Um, you know, any changes to the health care as a result of the health care commission's right. um, decision would still apply. So there, there, okay. there could be some monetary items there that would have been decided related to health care because they're no longer part of the local agreement. Okay. So Thank I, you. Yeah, I mean, I think in theory, yes, that could happen. In practice, I think it's probably unlikely yeah. that it would. I, I thought it was unlikely, but I just wondered if there was some sort of catch down the line that says, okay, you guys, 
have to do something differently. Yeah. Okay. There is in New Hampshire, but there's not in Vermont. Okay. <laughs> New, New okay. Hampshire, you vote, you vote separately on the teacher's contracts. So that it makes it very clear. Okay. Um, but that's obviously not the case here where uh, Vermont's is rolled into the overall budget. It makes me feel better that we finally got that phrase out that that's different in New Hampshire than Vermont. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, it feels weird if that is not the case. Thank you. <laughs> and sorry, Neil, one last question here. So the new, nor the unique nature of Vermont's education funding system. So just remind me again, so teachers, because of the way that the, you pay back into the state and they to pay you back and it's based on your property value and whatnot. So by definition, does that mean that teachers here in the Norwich area that we're paying a lot more than elsewhere because the higher cost of living that we're getting. How does that work with regards to the, what you're getting back from the state on a pu per pupil spending? Because that's um, the challenge here a bit, right? Is that as teachers, I mean, obviously you need to pay them a lot to live in the, this area versus maybe somewhere far north. But the per pupil spending on the state needs to be the same. So how's, how's that work? Uh, so the um, so the per pupil spending doesn't need to be the same, um, and in fact, it does vary by town. Um, Correct. The money back from the state though is the same. Uh, no, so you get um, it, um, it gets a little complicated. We really don't. Um, I, I don't view it as getting money back from the state. Um, the, the the funding mechanism here is that those monies raised through local property taxes right um, for the for the folks that are homeowners right who live here um, that's not enough to cover the school budget right so yep. the addition to that is all the non-residential property tax stuff and that's that's taxed at a single rate across the state so that doesn't vary by town so, um, you know, those a combination of those funds, then based on your but on your local per pupil spending, then um, that amount of tax revenue needs to be raised at the state level in order to be able to afford education. So, um, yes, decisions that are made locally can affect your property tax rate, but decisions that are made in other school districts affect the statewide ed tax rate. So we're sort of all in this big boat together and that decisions made in other districts have an influence on your local budget as well, or sorry, your local tax rate. I don't know if that really answered your question. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can figure this out later. I've just never been able to understand how, anyways, yeah, this is a Vermont problem. All right. <clears throat> All right. Any any other questions? Okay. So I did just want to briefly cover um, some of the resources that are available for the for the local bargaining for the teachers. So for for on our side, you guys know who our resources are. So it's Tom and I. It's you guys. Um, you know the board that finally makes the decision. Um, we're supported by Jamie and some of the other folks in HR that can um, help us with the numbers and everything like that. And we do um, reach out to legal counsel, um, both for consult and then if we were to move into um, you know, mediation and fact finding, then we would have um, uh, a more sustained presence of legal counsel there. Um, on the teachers side of things, um, the Vermont NEA is their support for bargaining. Um, and uh, they're a fairly substantial organization. Uh, they have seven Uniserv directors. These are directors that are split up by region across the state of Vermont. And um, their, uh, one of their primary um, roles is to support their, their local um, bargaining units in, in negotiations. Um, uh, we don't typically see the Uniserv director at the table for those first rounds of negotiations, um, but we do know that they're you know, working behind the scenes to assist the folks and helping them come up with their initial offers and counter offers and such. And then certainly when we move into mediation and the fact finding their, their Uniserv director is, is more frequently present. Um, NEA also has two full-time attorneys on staff um, in addition to seven Uniserv directors plus um, you know, uh, 10 plus um, additional staff members that cover a, a variety of different roles in the organization. Um, you know, one thing to note, I look back at the 2017 um, 
uh, IRS forms for Vermont NEA. Um, they had revenue of just shy of $6 million um, with expenses of uh, 5.1 million. Uh, each of those seven Uniserve directors, um, at least back in 2017, was making anywhere between 137 to almost $150,000 a year. Um, Where are they paid out of? How does how, all that get funded? Is that uh, mostly, all union paid dues. That? mostly union dues? There is some grant funding, I think, that comes through to the Vermont NEA, but I believe the majority of the revenue comes from, from dues. Um, I know early on when we talked about the step and track system, we mentioned that back in the 70s, Vermont ranked dead last in the country. Um, since the introduction of the step and track system and um, settlements across the state, um, they have come up a bit. So average starting salary in Vermont is $39,567. And this is, a, sorry, the data on the left hand of this slide is all provided by the, uh, the NEA, the national NEA. Um, so that puts uh, Vermont starting salary at a national rank of number 22. When you look at average salary, um, uh, current rank for Vermont teachers, there's number 17 in the nation. Um, when it comes to per pupil spending, Vermont actually ranks eight uh, in the nation on the amount that we spend per pupil. Um, the figures that you see to the right are the, the figures for, for Norwich. Okay, that uh, brings us to the end of this uh, overview. Does anyone have any questions about what's here? Okay, I'm gonna, we'll share out the, um, the slides and uh, with everybody after the, the meeting here along with some other uh, information as well. Um, and I'll just turn back to uh, our board docs and move on down the agenda then. And uh, next up, I, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a uh, reason for a non-public session. So if someone's willing to uh, offer a motion to enter us there, we, uh, we can do that. Neil? Uh, move to enter a non-public session in accordance with Title I, Section 313 for the discussion of negotiations. Okay, I have a second, Kelly. And I'll just go around with Lisa. Was not ready for that. Um, Christy, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Kelly? Christy, yes. Garrett? Palm, yes. And Candon, yes. And uh, does everyone have the uh, non-public link? We we'll use the same one as usual. Standard one, yeah. Yeah, okay. And for our attendees, uh, we do not have need to uh, come back into a public session. So I'm not, I'm gonna close out uh, this window here. And uh, Ryan, I'll be in touch with uh, non-public session minutes. Okay. Yep. All right. I will see you all on the non-public. Send me a text if you have any issues getting in there. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.